Um, hi there, my name's Claire McCracken. I'm a PhD candidate at RMIT University um, in Melbourne, Australia, and today I'll be discussing one of the projects that I completed as part of my practice-led research PhD in the School of Art at RMIT. So on the 21st of July 2018, I boarded the ANL Warringah container ship and sailed from Australia to China. The route roughly mirrors that of my great-great-grandmother, Amy Elizabeth Cathcart Payne, who travelled unaccompanied um, to Austra from Australia to Asia by ship in 1874. Elizabeth's diary, a well-thumbed, handwritten notebook, has been passed down through generations in my family as a treasured record of how our ancestors came to settle in Australia. What you'll hear today is a heavily abridged version of the autoethnographic writing I did while on board the ship. While you listen to that autoethnographic writing, I will screen some of the mixed media artworks that were made and some of the field photography that was produced during the voyage. The field photography was captured by my partner and collaborator Andrew Ferris, who travelled with me, and it'll be clearly labelled so, so that you can differentiate between the artworks and the field photography. The artworks that you'll see grew directly out of the experience of being at sea. At times this will be quite clear, as I've been able to match the artwork directly to the appropriate section of the diary. However, as this is only a 12 minute presentation, um, it, is all, it wasn't always possible. Finally, before I get started, it's important to note that as a way of embodying my great-great-grandmother's experience, lifting her experience off the page of her diary, I created a costume I wore to explore the ship daily. The costume was comprised of a pair of navy blue coveralls, the uniform of contemporary merchant shipping, a corset, a long section of fabric equal to about the length of a Victorian skirt, and a mask of Elizabeth's face. It was a bridging costume, part 19th, part 21st century. Trapped on the inside. Port time is a particularly busy time for the crew of a container ship. The rising cost of port dues and custom fees means that shipping containers try to turn a ship around as fast as possible, putting all hands on deck to make this achievable. To make sure we were safe from the containers floating from ship to shore, and to keep us out of the crew's way, we were confined to the accommodation block for the first 24 hours until we left the port. We spent the first couple of hours enjoying the view out our cabin window, a stack of containers framed by an insipid green curtain with a delicately ruffled pelmet of the same colour. I had imagined that the ship interior would be slick and clinical with hardened industrial edges, but this curtain and the silk trimming of the sunburnt orange blanket covering our bed was not only soft but homely. Other than the view, the only evidence that we were in a ship made for hard labour was some oily fingerprints left by a previous inhabitant that girt the inner edge of the curtain. Once we felt at home in our room, we decided it was time to explore the rest of the accommodation block, so I jumped into my oversized ultra-practical coveralls before wrestling my upper body into the corset. Sweaty and hot from effort, I then attempted to put on my shoes and realised I'd made a rookie's mistake. My lower back was so inflexible it took three goes and a very deep breath to pick up my shoes. I then tried a series of awkward positions and applied as much will as I could muster, but there was no way I could put them on. Deflated and defeated, I perched on a chair because a corset prevents all lounging and forces you to sit on the very edge of your seat and dejectedly asked my partner to put my shoes on. From level D, our level, I attempted to head down the stairs to check out the communal areas but quickly realised that I'd have to relearn how to navigate all physical movements in a corset. Rather than the normal casual glide I'd perform to head down a set of stairs, I had to stand up straight, grip the rail and take one step at a time. The corset made me so upright I couldn't see my feet and I had to feel my way down the stairs one at a time. On deck A we entered the cruise mess, a large space filled with the detritus of busy sailors, including fresh fruit, bottles of water and some discarded pieces of clothing. Red and white gingham tablecloths with a protective sheet of vinyl covered the tables, along the edges of which we could see the same oily fingerprints that girt our bedroom curtains. On the wall hang a 2018 calendar with a photograph of a young Asian woman, completely nude, body turned away from the camera so you could see the side of one breast and the contour of her bottom. The title of the calendar read... Gretzim Maritime Services Shanghai, your reliable ship shandler at all ports of China. Growing up in 1980s Australia, these posters, part utilitarian ca calendar, part pornography, part advertising, were a standard item in auto mechanic garages. Slowly throughout the 1990s, they disappeared from the central part of the shop to the depth of offices rarely visited by customers. While these posters are a familiar sem symptom of a sexist all-male work environment, like a wolf whistle on the street they signal that a woman's body is out of place. On the ship I was outnumbered by men 1 to 22, but I felt at home in my floating leviathan, connected to its rhythms. 
The poster was one of those shocking everyday reminders of not belonging that women and minorities experience, which jolts you from the warmth of feeling comfortable or belonging in place, reminding you that in this place you are the other, exotic and endangered. From the cruise mess we walked along the gully, which was full of large-scale stainless steel contraptions designed to feed a large amount of people at low cost, and entered the officer's mess the place where we would eat while on board the ship. Despite the fact that there were only four officers, compared to 17 crew members, the officer's mess was three times the scale of the crew's and included a games area, three tables covered in dainty white and floral tablecloths, and a smoking section. The piece de resistance of the officer's mess was a flower box separating the smoking and games area of the room from the dining area, filled with dusty plastic versions of Van Gogh's sunflowers, orchids and Swiss cheese plant leaves. I stood there in shock, I felt like I'd walked into the contrasting pastel colours, trinket-filled and symmetrical detailing of a Wes Anderson film set. Great care and consideration had obviously been taken to, by the original interior designer to create this environment. It looked like they'd delved into an archive of home improvement magazines from the 1970s. Pulling out a vinyl seat to sit down and soak in the rest of the decor, I observed that there was no pornographic calendar in the officer's mess, just the gentleman's version, a Paul Gauguin print depicting a relaxed, semi-clad Tahitian woman with her dog, trimmed by a gold frame. Fresh air at last. For the first exploration of the ship, I left my costume behind so I could concentrate on handrails and slippery steps while working out the layout of the vessel. At 275 metres long, 40 metres wide, and 12 storeys high, the footprint of our leviathan was vast. I felt this scale profoundly when we walked up to the vessel docked in the port. On board ship, however, the immensity was compounded by an emerging sense that we were alone. There were 21 crew on board busily maintaining the ship, squirrelled away in its layers and folds. However, after several hours of exploration, we saw none of them. Distracted by the textures of the ship, this sense of isolation would fade in and out of your consciousness. But when you became aware of it, there was always a couple of seconds of confusion, like the feeling you get when you apprehend halfway through an impassioned narrative to a loved one on the other end of the phone that you've lost reception and are talking to no one. The more I got to know the ship, the more I learnt to read the presence of people even if I wasn't seeing them. Near the CO2 room, I'd discover a pair of gloves still expanded from the presence of hands sitting waiting for a worker with the pads on the palms imprinted with the oil of the ship outlining the unique shape of the wearer's fingers. Even without the body, the human scale and texture of these gloves, when contrasted against the solidity of the ship's steel, would momentarily fill me with the warmth of human presence. Collectively, these objects felt like moments of resistance against the scale of the boat and the loneliness of working at sea and feeling solitary in such a vast and dangerous environment. There were other beautiful objects that expressed this resistance too, and hinted at the life beyond the daily grind of fixing rust spots and re repairing engines. Moments, for example, where the crew had found a way to commandeer the utilitarian purpose of the boat into an object of leisure. My favourite example of this was a swing made from looped recycled rope and two boards which swayed delicately at the back of the ship, framed by a proscenium arch of grey steel. The swing was not so much a momentary resistance but a lasting indelible mark that would have been enjoyed by many different crew members throughout the life of the ship. The Whiff of Globalisation Sometimes during the night the wind would change direction and the smoking stacks of our leviathan would send their heady toxic burn off straight into the air ducts of the ship's accommodation block. I would wake in the middle of the night with a heavy headache and a desperate need for fresh air. I'm not sure if it was this smell or the sounds of the mounds of containers creaking like huge old giants with tired muscles and aching bones, but I had repetitive vivid nightmares throughout the voyage. In one dream I was walking down the steep white ladder that ran from the decks that cantilevered from the accommodation block to sea level when I suddenly fell, tumbling from step to step down five flights of stairs, joints stretched, head pounded and my screams carried away by the wind. In another dream, I exited the accommodation block on the deck at sea level, trod on an oil patch and slipped impossibly quickly under the rails into the gurgling immensity of the ocean. I'd wake with a jolt and look around my cabin, where the stack of containers in the window was lit by the red port and green starboard lights of our ship. The most terrifying part of these dreams is that they were completely plausible, accidents waiting to happen as I scaled and glided along the layers of the ship. There were some other interesting smells on the A&L Warringa. Amongst the collection of haphazard materials at the bow of the ship sat several containers full of cow hides, stripped from bovine carcasses quickly salted to partially preserve and then piled up inside. The blood and lymph from these um, hides dripped through the cracks in the containers and onto the deck, pooling in rusty divots and undrained corners. 
Walking through this zone as we travelled got progressively acrid, despite the crew's efforts hosing the area down daily with fresh water from the ship's substantial reserves. By the time we crossed the equator and hit the tropics, there was barely a breeze to move the odour and the air fell heavily around our nostrils. With this stifling heat, the containers quickly became ovens, until by day eight we could find the odd, fat maggot wriggling in the puddles of cow juice. The constant vibration and loud hum of the ship's motor made my skin tingle. It was like standing within a couple of metres of a jackhammer. There was, however, one place on the ship where you could escape it, right at the front of the vessel, just beyond the masses of containers. This space was also free from the noxious odour of the bunker fuel. Consequently, I would head there daily to sit, breathe deeply and settle the tingling in my skin. Unfortunately, the only way to get there was to navigate past the seeping containers of cow hides. In fact, by day three, I could barely venture past them without holding my nose or pressing the collar of my coveralls into my nostrils. When I ventured past in the corset, with my breath made shallow from its grip on my ribcage, I actually began to dry reach. Corsets make deep breaths impossible, so I had no choice but to consume the full dynamic bouquet of decomposing cow. Land ahoy. It was oh three hundred hours by the time we dropped anchor, and we wound our way down the stairs from the bridge to our cabin, falling into an exhausted sleep with the rhythm of the engine one last time. We'd made it to Shanghai, so it was time to say goodbye. Laying there waiting for sleep to come, I realised with surprise that I'd become attached to our leviathan. For thirteen days it had kept me protected from the enormity of the sea, delivering me safely from Australia to China. At sixteen years old, it is a tired and corroded vessel, one that will be dismantled and recycled soon. So as I drifted off to sleep, I found myself whispering a type of incantation to the pulse of the engine, thanking it for its service, not just to myself and world economics, but most importantly to the crew and officers. While the crew of the a and Wiringa may, like the million seafarers at sea right now, be largely invisible to those of us on land, enjoying the things they deliver us daily, to our ship they are everything. They are the only thing keeping the constant impact and atrophy of seawater at bay, and for that our big old ship keeps them safe. The a and Wiringa is an ecosystem of care where each party keeps a close eye on what the other will not survive and protects them from it. As the incantation petered out and I fell into a deep sleep, the thought of this made me profoundly happy, and for the first time in 13 days I had a night without a nautical nightmare.